Hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for tuning in tonight um, for our panel discussion on elitism in the American theater. Um, my name is Atlise Robinson. I'm the founding artistic director of Ambiance Theater Company. Ambiance is a very new emerging black led theater company based in the Twin Cities. Um, we have been alive and around and doing work for about two years. Um, Ishe Brantley and Malik Cisse are both the two core members along with myself. And so I'm just grateful that you all have tuned in tonight. Um, and so the conversation we have, we'll have tonight will be very focused on experiences of these artists. Um, and I think that's something that's crucially important. One of the reasons why I established Ambiance was because I wanted to see more opportunities for people like myself. Um, when the first event that I did, I didn't know anything about producing. I just winged it and it turned out well in, it, in that case. You know, when I think about like the seeds that are planted um, that have grown up into all of the theater companies that are culturally specific that exist in this country, like Theater Move, like Penumbra Theater, um, we have a legacy in this country that should be celebrated and not pushed to the side. And that is why we have this conversation tonight. Um, so without, um, before we get into the conversation, I would love for our panelists to please introduce themselves. Um, thank you all for being a part of this. Thank you, Either thank one. you, Elise. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in, I'll just go start. Hi, um, aloha everybody, hello. My name is Ova Saopeng. I am a performing artist uh, with uh, Tira Productions. I'm the co-artistic director of this company based in Los Angeles, uh, the land of the Tongva. So I just wanted to do some land acknowledgement there as well. Um, it's important uh, for us to know the, the originals people where uh, we stand on um, uh, in, in terms of the land. Um, I am a, a theater artist at work with refugees and immigrants. Um, Tita has been around for over 20 years and um, just phenomenal to be able to share what uh, the experiences that I have and to see these young emerging artists as well uh, coming into the forefront. So uh, I will leave it at that. I'll jump in. Um, what's my name? Oh. <laughs> My name is Saimukta Bonsai, and um, I use she, her, hers, and I'm currently uh, the, the Mellon Playwright in Residence at Theatre Moo, which is based in St. Paul, and we are on the historical lands of the Dakota and Anishinaabe people, and um, what else do you want to know about me? Nothing other than I'm excited for this conversation. Uh, I'll kick it to Ishe. Peace, everybody. My name is Ishe Brantley. I am the director of performance at Ambiance Theater Company. I am a multidisciplinary artist. I've been in the Twin Cities uh, theater making scene, uh, poet scene since I was about 14 years old. I'm super excited to have this conversation. I think that um, it's going to really be able to plant some seeds um, in the BIPOC theater making community that haven't been able to uh, be, be planted yet. So grateful to be here. Malik. Uh, salam, everybody. My name is Malik Cisse. He, him, his. Um, I am the Associate Artistic Director of Ambiance Theater Company. Um, I'm also a playwright and a theater maker who grew up, grew and uh, developed in the Twin Cities, but now I reside in um, Los Angeles. I'm very blessed to be a part of this panel along with many other brilliant artists, but also just to have a very important necessary conversation about something that I feel is long overdue. Um, and so now we're here and now we're having, planting one seed of many that should be planted. And um, I look forward to seeing how our conversation unfolds. Thank you all so much. Um, so the first question I wanna ask um, is how um, do we define elitism specifically in your own terms, in your own words? Um, what is it to you and how has it shown up throughout your career? Um, and anybody can hop in, you know, I don't want to pick on nobody. Uh, I'll start. Um, I'm going to always be doing like little analogies because that's how I talk. I talk in like analogies. So elitism to me is the same uh, 10 people at the, at the table um, and other folks wanting to be able to sit at that table, 
but those folks saying, well, you haven't um, been through this or you haven't had this experience or just work a little harder and, and maybe we'll pull up a seat. Um, elitism to me is not ever allowing other folks to sit at that table, um, but telling people, it's a, come serve us, come serve us. No, you can't sit here, but it's okay for you to come and serve us. And so I think it's important that we learn how to create space around the table for folks coming into theater um, and folks that have been around um, cultivating the art scene um, and letting them know, come eat with me. We are in community um, and just creating more, more space, if that makes any sense. Well, yeah. That's my definition of elitism. Well, that makes perfect sense, Isha. I hear exactly what you're saying. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. For me, that that power, right? Like this, this, the same, like very few people having so much power. And then also, like, I think sometimes when you don't have formal training in theater making in some way, like as a playwright or as a director, or whatever, people do tend to look down on you as if, um, the histories that you come from and with, all of the cultural knowledge and, and memory knowledge that you come with from your, your people, your culture, your community doesn't matter. And I think that's that's so sad because we, we're, we're so rich with all of this knowledge and skills and um, we have to continually fight to, like you said, Ishe, have a place at the table, not just to come and serve, but to like, be decision makers and to like really shape what things look like when we present it to the community or, or even make work with community, right? Which is why I love Teeta so much because they make work for and with and it's by community. Um, and you don't have to be formally trained, which is, it's great. <laughs> yeah, going off of that, I think um, elitism to me is also creating a sort of sort of status quo or a claiming of the dominant or the superior culture over what is the multifaceted interdisciplinary um, as well as the the multiplicity of different cultures and um, acknowledgement of those individuals and, and as well as that work that's implied on theater and it is quite unfortunate when, you know, there's higher powers or a smaller group that holds so much of the resources and so much of the power when there is so much power in the roots of our cultures and the roots of our um, creation. And um, elitism to me is a strip away um, from things that could change our, 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 our disciplines, change our, um, change our spaces for the better um, and keeping what is consistent around that uh, dominant culture. Um, and so I think when we when we talk about elitism, we must ask ourselves like, is that such a thing? And how do we dismantle that to create more space? So. I, I agree with everything everyone's saying. I think, uh, when, when you posed the question, I was thinking about well, what is not elitism. And to me, what's not elitism is to be welcome, to be open, to be respectful. Um, and that's the kind of practice that um, as a theater maker, as an artist that I have learned to uh, create and learn to offer, because I come in with a certain amount of knowledge in terms of theater, but when we work with communities, refugees and immigrants that we work with, they, as Mook said, have, have the knowledge and, and, and their stories are, are beautiful and important, but how do we merge that in a way that's equitable, in a way that is full of diversity, in a way that is open? And I think that's, that's, I think that's the hard part for most elitist organizations. They don't see that. They don't see how the fact that you gotta be open, you gotta reach out and, and really go out to the community, it's not just you know here here's the door and come in for that one moment. No, no, it's you know you open the doors and you gotta ask and see how it, does this work. I mean, it's a conversation. So um, that's uh, my thoughts on 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 that that question. So 
Well, at least I want to kick it back to you because when you posed this question on your Facebook page, I want to say last month, or was it like a month and a half ago? Yeah, it wasn't far away. It was like pretty recent. But what what made you um, want to pop that question? Not that something happened, or was it just mm-hmm. everything happening? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for me, I think a lot of it came from a desire to, well, like, like I was saying, like when I started Ambiance, you know, I was at a point in my career where I was getting a lot of gigs as a stagehand and I had no issues and no problems with that. Like I'm the type of person where I'm so dedicated to theater. If I'm involved in a production that feeds my soul I don't care if I am only sweeping the floor and mopping it, you know, like I don't mind that, but I felt so limited in a lot of spaces. And I realized I had more leadership abilities um, that I could implement into these spaces and they weren't being utilized. And so when I went off and I did a reading at Pangea, like it was just, I just rolled the dice. Like that's literally how it was. And so I was working with people who didn't have theater experience necessarily. I had people who did have some theater experience. Maybe they had performance experience in other areas of their lives, but not theater specifically. And so I wanted to have this conversation um, to be able to, like I said, celebrate all of these other things that represent our histories, that represent our ways of knowing, that represents you know, our, our forms of storytelling. Like classical theater doesn't have to be taught, you know, by just the Greeks and Shakespeare. That's not the only, those those texts are not the only texts written in poetic or prose form like that. There's so much more to the world, you know, and that's what I love to celebrate because we as people who are black and brown, we're not the minority in the world. Like we are the majority of the people in the world. And so it's so frustrating to live in a western culture that teaches you that you gotta know about european history before you know about yourself and this goes beyond you know just theater this is the way racism functions in this country you know and so that's why this conversation is important to me as well is to really get at the ways in which racism continue to function in all aspects of our lives and how it gets into the work that we create because even artists that are black and brown you know, have, you know, I perpetuate elitism on myself sometimes, you know, I feel like I got to go to grad school. And I'm not saying that graduate school is a bad thing. I can thrive in academic spaces. I know this about myself. But at the same time, all of those stories that I got from my mom, from my dad, all of my own lived experience, all of that is all a, a canon of work that can uplift, that can educate um, and really shake some things up in the way we see and understand the world. And I, I love being able to do stuff that's outside of the box. So, yes, thank you for it. Uh, now I, I feel so calm now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, and, and, and what you're saying that resonates with me is the fact that we are valuing our, the, our, our lived experiences. We are valuing the process in which we create work. We are valuing our stories, you know, because like, as you say, we, you know, I mean, and I'll have to be on, I mean, I have to be honest. I, I come from, I mean, I, I went to, to school uh, for theater. I was, uh, you know, trained in, uh, you know, Western theater, Western European theater mindset. You know, I had very g- small glimpses of just Asian American theater. I did some Asian American plays, but they were very limited. And so that's, that's for me, I, from what I hear from you is like, how do we continue to develop and cultivate and expand and support more of the, this, this value within our communities? And it's hard. It's hard. It's not easy because, again, within the field, sometimes you're going to be the only one. Mm-hmm. Also, you may be the only one as the performer. And then, you know, the performer is like the, you're on stage or the actor, but hey, there's other other uh, jobs and roles within the theater field. I mean, you were mentioning about how I love how you're saying about well, I go all in with all the productions, and I I, I work in maybe in the technical field. We don't have enough. Where where are the the community uh, the, the the artists of color that are in the technical field, right? Lighting designers and stuff. So I'm I'm just saying that that's it. Kind of starts with us, kind of almost like we're we're in a space. We're looking around and like, okay, am I the only one here? And if I'm the only one, and what the heck, you know, can I bring in 
other brothers and sisters and friends to come in and, and be a part of it or to say, hey, I can do it. If I can do it, hopefully, you know, the next generation or other folks can do too. So that's kind of where for me it, it rolls. And I've been fortunate enough to come from a background where I grew up in a, a community called Kalihi and I, I grew up in Hawaii and Kalihi was basically the rough and it was the hood. It was the hood. It was the rough and tough neighborhood of my community. And my high school was known for uh, a lot of uh, new, new folks that were coming in, what they call fresh off the boat. A lot of Filipinos, a lot of Laotians, Southeast Asians, uh, Chinese, uh, Japanese. And so we didn't have theater, but my entry into theater was this, was this company called T-Shirt Theater and they really gave me this opportunity to just tell your story, just tell, write, write a story. And my first performance I remember was I wrote a poem about my family's escape from Laos. And that poem then was the first time that I got to see that piece. And then we, per, we, we put it on its feet and I got to perform it and got to share it with the rest of my school. And that was so empowering and powerful. I, and, 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 and that stayed with me. And then so I kept on continuing to realize that, hey, I have a place in, in this theater. And of course, sadly, I discovered as I went to college and as I came here to the, the mainland, the continent, totally different, totally different. Um, because you see elitism, you see racism very clearly, you know. And so that's, that's, uh, that's been a little bit of my journey. So, um, yeah. What, what do you all have to say? Ishe, Malik. Young ones, bring it on, bring it on. I just want to say, I just want to say, yes, yes, yes. That's, that's my, that was my entry to theater. Shout out to Crystal Spring at Black Box, at, at Washburn High School, teaching Black Box Social Justice Theater. Okay. Because, oh my God, okay? Mm -hmm. I would have never thought that I could be doing this work yeah. without just the opportunity to say how I feel to express myself and I think that we have to remember that in everything that we do as we're introducing folks that don't have the the technical training right it doesn't matter it does not matter it comes for especially for black and brown folk it comes from literally telling our narratives and our stories that we are able to even exist in spaces that we don't belong in, that a play that was not written for us. It's because we have a real deep passion and love for theater because we understand how impactful it can be on a person's life. Mm -hmm. You know, just the representation of Cinderella at Children's Theater, right? Seeing a black woman play Cinderella. What? Mm -hmm. On stage, what? You know what I'm saying? That that's changing, that's changing my mind as a young black girl. Seeing that, and it, and it and it's so much more impactful than film or any other media because it is happening live in front of me. After you know, if if able, I can go and shake her hand and say, "Oh my goodness, like this is so exciting!" You know, to see you up there. Like, how did you get there? And it's just being able to tell your narrative will literally 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 like save your life theater saved my life yeah. i'm sorry i get so passionate but <laughs> um, i'm in i'm in the same boat with you yeah like theater theater was something that saved my life um i you know when i when i looked at theater at one point and when i was a younger kid i often looked at broadway i often looked at avenue q i often looked at any and you know um but then when you, when, you, when you strip that a little bit away, what I ended up learning over time was that theater isn't just a device specific to Broadway or a Lord, you know, a, a Lord, you know, theater company was like, it also can mean grassroots. It can mean the bare bottom. It could mean we are taking these, you know, these stories and we're putting it together through different mediums too, not just um, a stage script. It could be poetry. It could be improv. It could be dance. You know, it could be rap. <laughs> um, I learned. I learned theater through that. You know, lens. And when I realized that, I learned that theater could be accessible. It could become something that we we 
we rely on as a tool to um, express ourselves, escape from this like reality that um, we need so much resources to create what we have, but we, we, we scrapped it together. We, we worked together to get those things together. And that's, that's the theater I come from. That's the theater I've, I've, I've developed and grew out of. Um, and, um, you know, I'm in the same headspaces, at least when it comes to, uh, you know, schooling and the way we learn about it. You know, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm in a master's program right now. But even in the same sense, I, I still ask the same questions as though I would ask before I even got into undergrad, before I even got into master's program, like, how is this theater, how is this piece, how is this work utilized to, to change the communities in which I'm impacting? How, uh, how is it impacting these, these groups, these communities? And through that is accessibility, through that is, um, you know, providing theater that's not on a uh, 20 to $50 ticket, but something that people can go to, to to touch closer than just this, like, um, this way in which American theater has grown to become. Um, so I do think like with, with a lot of these, these necessities also comes the simple fact that we are expressing ourselves on these stages and there's easy ways to do that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I hear that a lot. I mm -hmm. mean, one of the things, just to kind of, what I'm hearing mainly too, is just the fact that, you know, theater, a lot of times for us is not entertainment only. Like it has a real, a real purpose in um, healing us emotionally, healing us spiritually. Um, and allowing us to embody, you know, the things that we need to embody in order to be healed and to be better. You know, one of the things that, um, I can't ever say his last name, so I feel bad, but Resmo, who wrote My Grandmother's Hands, like a lot of times like, in that book, he references the fact that when you experience trauma, you have to be able to release the, the action that you needed to complete at the moment that it happened. And that's why people have traumas because they get stuck. They can't get it out. And so, you know, getting on stage like Uche, you know, I was a part of a, a up and coming social justice theater program at Central High School. And then I went on to be a summer institute kid at Penumbra. And so it's like that work saved my life because it allowed me to process the things in my body that I wasn't even aware was affecting me negatively. Um, so yeah, Worry Boko is joining us. It's good to see you. Um, so cool. Um, thank y'all so much for that so far already. Like I'm fired up now. Um, so I want to, I think one of the things that we are kind of talking about a little bit is like being overlooked and undervalued as an artist and as like the, the types of creation that we come from, because, you know, everybody wants to make it big when well, I even say everybody, but people, you know, epitomize making it big on Broadway, as opposed to you know, what does it mean to be a community led theater that does work with immigrants or does work with people who have been sex trafficked or things like that? You know, what, you know, what, when in your career have you felt uh, overlooked or undervalued, um, either in your own practice as a person or just your um, ideology around what theater can be and, and how your creative process rolls out? I'll, I'll throw my hat in there because I was thinking about this. And um, so I, I've learned that process over product is much better <laughs> because again, what we're talking about is like, you know, obviously it's great to have that big production and that product with everything. And yes, that is wonderful. But the process in which we create the work, we develop the work, we write the work, whether it be with ourselves as writers or with community, alongside community, that journey in creating the work with ensemble for, for me, uh, with other artists of color and community far outweighs the production because the impact on the participants is much more transformative because the work that like Tira does, because we paved the way for voices from the Southeast Asian, Micronesian, refugee, immigrant communities. And, and it's also very, when we work in that way, we're also working with issues that are relevant, that are, are eminent. 
you know, within those communities. And, you know, and that's why to me, it's really, really powerful to hear that. So to, to and, and I, I would have to say, I think I never really, um, I, I would say I was overlooked because I'm a Lao, one of the first Lao American actors who was in a program. I was this Southeast Asian guy who was even within the Asian American, you know, uh, labeling. And we're going to go to the labeling too in terms of when we talk about BIPOC and stuff, right? But just how I wasn't being represented. A lot of the Asian American plays that had been developed or already were available were mostly East Asian. Chinese, they were about Chinese Americans. They were about Japanese Americans. They were about Korean Americans. There weren't that many Southeast Asians. So I had to pave the way for Southeast and a Southeast Asian voice, for a Lao voice to, to be there. And the first play that I worked on that really dove into kind of exploring that and I had been trained again been trained kind of you know Shakespeare the western canon and all this stuff and I'm like well what about what about the stories that I have what about the refugee stories that I have you know and so that's kind of where we developed a play called Refugee Nation um, a play that we worked with Lao communities we went to Minnesota and interviewed elders and community members I I I talked with other people, uh, other di La Laotian diaspora within the U.S. And out of that, we shaped this play and we got to tour it. And, um, you know, Mooks was one of the people who got to see the play back then. And, and Mooks was actually, in her younger days, w w was just kind of kind of gleaning into what is this, you know, theater making? And so I, I became, uh, you know, kind of like a, a leader and a mentor. So, um, but, but I had to understand that for myself that look, I, I have to create and start owning the own work and value my own work, you know, forget what other people say, what is important to me? Yeah. And let's start with that and let's see what comes out of that, so. I love that, what, what, what matters to me? <laughs> I love that so much. Hey, Warrior Vocals. I'm glad that you're here. It's good to see you. Hi, everyone. My name is Warrior Voco. I am a third year student at the University of Minnesota Guthrie program studying acting. And um, I am a, my pronouns are he, him, and I am a performance creator. I act, I write, I direct, I kind of dabble here and there because I always need to keep busy. Mm -hmm. um, but just to kind of like touch on like the subject brought up at hand, I think of like, I think as a Black theater artist, you're always going to be overlooked. It's something that you have to like learn early coming into it. You know, there's sometimes like I even make the joke myself. I'm like the amount of therapy I would have like needed if I was a Black person studying STEM would have probably been less than studying theater sometimes. Oh, no. Because like, I mean, <laughs> it's like a hard truth and it's a hard humor, but um. It's just like you have these two options, whether it's to like surmount the challenge like brought up in front of you or like either like fall in line with like what is given. And like I've been in like both aspects as a student and like even in rehearsal room practices. But like one of the craziest things that like came to my mind is like, especially in school, um, while in school, like there have been many times where like, I have this kind of joke where I say every year I make a professor cry um, <laughs> because I'm like, that's not true. Or they're like, this is why, and I'm like, actually white people did not start with this. Um, it's like, I've forced myself to kind of like decolonize my education because at the end of the day, we also have to acknowledge that the American theater that we are constant, that we are standing on is like, a theater that started from colonization and was built on the backs of making jokes out about of the lives of people of color from minstrel shows to red face with a lot of indigenous lives to like of course the different kinds of eyeliner they use for many asian characters like we have to acknowledge how like people of color are sorry bipoc people we've kind of laid the groundwork for culture of the US and like we see those parallels like today and we're still struggling with those issues of like appropriation and like this is why you can't say this word or like this kind of respectability and like it's I'm oh, sorry if you hear a dog we have a puppy here but like it's just like that you always like are with that challenge of like I know coming into this like I'm they don't expect to see 
like for instance, a black man like me of my size being six one and big, like be soft or like go for more vulnerable roles. It's just like a politics that like you learn to either fight against or like go with really. And it depends on what party you belong to. Thank you so much for your book. I agree wholeheartedly with a lot of things that you said. Um, this is a really hard question for me. <laughs> um, I definitely feel undervalued in the Twin Cities theater making community. Um, I wholeheartedly believe that if it was not for Adelise Robinson and Malik C. Say that I would have left the theater making community in the Twin Cities. I don't wanna get emotional on here today. Um, I went to Columbia College Chicago after being a part of the Twin City Theater community for a very long time. Um, and I didn't care what role I was playing. I just wanted to be a part and I wanted to learn. Um, and I was making it known to everybody that this is what I wanted to do. And I didn't know necessarily I'm sorry, and I didn't know necessarily how I was going to make it happen. Um, and so I was taking whatever gig was thrown at me at whatever price, even though I knew um, that I needed to make a living. Um, and most of the time picked up whatever job I needed to pick up in order to make sure that I could still be available in those spaces without having to worry about feeding myself because I wasn't getting paid what I was worth at the time. Um, I left to go to Columbia College Chicago because many of my mentors told me that I must get a theater education and must get a theater training in order to be um, a part of these conversations. Um, I came back pregnant and I, I asked the people that I have been creating with here in the Twin Cities, how do I do this as a mother? Um, give it up basically is what I got back. Give it up or go back to school, figure it out through school. Um, I didn't get any real answers or solutions, right? So I gave it up and I got a job at US Bank. Um, and I got a phone call from at least mm -hmm. saying, hey, I'm putting on a show uh, for readings and I wanted to know if you had any plays that you wanted to put on. And it was in that moment, right? While I was eight months pregnant, sitting across from at least um, and being like, yeah, yeah, let's do this, right? Let's like, let's do theater together and, and let's make it feasible. It wasn't until I did the garden with Ambiance Theater in 2019 and I was directing with my son on my hip where I really felt like, somebody didn't give up on me and somebody really seen that, that I needed to be doing this work. Um, and so it is only through Ambiance Theater Company that I show up still in the Twin Cities theater community. And, and yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, don't have me on here. <laughs> thank you for being vulnerable with us like that and sharing that testimony and being who you are and just know you how loved you are and how appreciated you are and I know you know we I know you know we you know we appreciate you and we love you and that your voice is always valuable in this space always no matter what yeah no nah, anyway um where we at <laughs> <laughs> Also, like, uh, sorry, just to add on to like, Ishe, thank you so much, first of all, for sharing such a vulnerable, like, part of you, like, yourself, like, to the space. Like, I highly, like, respect that because not many people, no matter the age or where or how much training or how bougie they are, could do that. So thank you. And I think, like, even your story is a testament to, like, we have to acknowledge also um, within the theater and like overlooking people, we still can't sit here and not overlook like the mistreatment of black women in the American theater. And like a lot of like women of color in the American theater as well in proportion to their our, like white feminine counterparts. It's something we see with writing. It's something we see with like staging and archetypes as well. Like we celebrate this and it's it's the same thing we see with, the, with musicals. Like 
there there are black women who write a lot of like black women ex people who write who do this who do that who do that but yet they are left behind on the table and it's like the only reason like they may even hire like that one black person or this one other person of color is because like oh hey because you're here you're meant to like solve this decades long issue of racism for us right and you're like i just got here and it's even as a student, you see it because like it's at the blueprint of our education. Like I can't sit here and not say I've not only had to be a student, but I've had to be a teacher at the same time. And a lot of like BIPOC people who are going through like undergrad and college or like theater summer camps, like go through that same thing where you're like teaching a teacher, but also teaching your company. And it then brings the question like, when do theater artists of color have that opportunity to actually sit down and consume education in the same way as our white counterparts? It's like, how do we change the scope of the educational training coming forward to the future? Because if you keep saying, oh, all these programs are the future of theater, like you see it even in auditioning for programs. At Unifieds, there were times I felt like meat for schools because I was black, I could sing, I could do it. And like, compared to all the other white boys who are doing the same auditions as me and it begs the question just like when does like why, why do we have to always start with separating technique and identity and marrying both without like starting with just that like unified fixture going forward and that's just something I kind of wanted to like touch on that's absolutely phenomenal and I'm really glad that you spoke to um, the ways that we can reimagine the training process of getting people prepared for professional careers in theater. Um, that's a whole separate conversation in and of itself. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, real quick. I um, also just want to acknowledge uh, just real quick the, the theater makers who aren't necessarily people who are part of theater that may not necessarily be, say, director or actor. I'm thinking about the uh, administrators. I'm thinking about those in tech. Um, I've also had experiences in the administration where I was often overlooked or um, under, mainly undervalued and overlooked. Um, I was a part of a, a larger theater for several years at one point and um, I had to lead a lot of spearhead and, and organized a lot of the the huger auditions and I remember a lot often being exhausted tired feeling like I, I deserve to get paid more feel like I deserve to have more um help assistance but knowing the fire that I am inside me I, I said I, I'll power through I'll do this I'll do this work um and it, it wasn't until we had like staff meetings or um emails of acknowledgement where in those times where I thought I would get that appraisal, nothing but crickets, nothing but silence, um, nothing but um, ignoring. Um, and that's when, A, I realized that like the validation <laughs> of large theaters are, uh, are something that I don't need, um, or I feel like wouldn't give me an equal amount of appreciation, but also just that there's other you know, administrators out there, other um, POC uh, uh, tech crew out there that still get treated in the same way, get treated with the same undervalued. And um, I just want to say that if when we're when we're thinking about American theater, we're also thinking about the hierarchical systems that still are in play, that still are structured to um, canonize the artistic process the directors and actors, but neglect all who are behind the scenes making it happen. And so, um, you know, when I think about undervaluement, I, 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 I think about all of those, especially in this time now, the pandemic with so much constraint from being able to do that work, you know, anymore, almost indefinitely at this moment. Um, so, I, I mean, I want, I want us to have better acknowledgement of POCs in these positions and better acknowledgement of uh, the hard work we put in, uh, the many emails, the many, the many uh, uh, things that we have to organize to maintain the larger image of what that theater is. And 
really, really have a thorough clarity and a thorough um, uh, thankfulness of, of those people in line as well, so. I love that, you know, because it, it's one of those things where, you know, you learn ensemble when you're on stage, but ensemble is the whole company, you know, all the way down to the person cleaning the toilets, you know, because if any piece is out of place, it's not a welcoming space, you know, the actors can't do what they got to do, the audience don't want to be there, like, everybody is essential, everybody's necessary, everybody should be celebrated, you know, and I, as somebody who has been backstage, you know, I've had wonderful interactions with actors backstage, and I've had some actors acting like I was just a butler, and it's like, girl, I'm here, I'm, I'm paid just like you. <laughs> Chill out. <laughs> you know, so it's, yes, I, I really love that you speak to that. Um, Mux, do you have, like, um, do you want to add anything uh, to, like, being, feeling overlooked or undervalued in your career at any point, um, or just more to what we've been talking about? Yeah, so um, I'm, I think I'm the only one on this panel who has zero formal training in theater. Yeah. I don't know theater terms. I don't know how many theaters are out there in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But so what, what happens to me often is that I would go into a theater space and I would be around a lot of like established directors or like actors and all these people. And they would look at me and be like, who are you? And I would honestly, in my mind, go, who are you? Like, literally, who? I don't know who you are. <laughs> You're a blank slate to me. Um, which gives me, like, this sort of freedom of, like, meeting people, you know, like, how they are meeting me. Like, what's the energy? And so, mm -hmm. um, and I'm fortunate because so much of my learnings come from people from the community who are, like, sharing resources with me, sharing knowledge giving me opportunities because you know, I come from a spoken word background. I'm actually a, a poet. Um, and the first person who really gave me um, a chance was uh, Reginald Edmund, who was a Many Voices fellow, or was it Jerome Fellow at the Playwright Center? And he started a Playwrights of Color Collective. And so he invited me into, this, into the, the group, um, knowing I have no theater experience, but he was like, you might get sick of poetry, so why don't why don't you explore theater? And I was like, okay, and it worked out great for me, so I'm not complaining. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the thing, like this, like credentials. I don't think it's it's bad. Like having a degree in, in theater is it's not bad. It's great. Like whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but it becomes a problem when it's it's like the only thing that's used to measure someone's knowledge or ability. And I might get in trouble for sharing this, but a friend of mine applied for a job at a theater um, to do some sort of like artistic directing work or something like that and didn't get the job because they didn't have the MFA or the, the BA, whatever, right? I don't know. I don't know acronyms. Um, and in our discussion, we were like, but, but you know what? The, the founding director doesn't have a degree either. Like homie was just a hippie back in the day that liked to perform and started a company. Um, so, I don't know, I won't name names. No, I, I mean, I will just say for one, um, just cause I have been paying attention. I think I saw you at Giant Step Speak a while ago. And that's when I started really paying attention to your career and the work that you've been doing. And so for me, you're, a, you're truly a testament of how to get around elitism because you don't have all of this quote unquote formal training and yet you're the Mellon uh, fellow. Like this stuff like that, that really inspires me to keep moving forward, even though we are dealing with all these different things and we are um, running into, you know, these forms of elitism in our careers because it's not impossible to make whatever career you want to have you know, even if you don't have the degree or this, that, or the third, or you're not connected to 20 other people who do this over there, you know, like, it just, it gets to be, yeah, anyway, I don't care for that. I don't care for that either, because how, how he gonna start a whole theater company with nothing and then tell somebody else, no, you gotta have a whatever, and it's like, come on, man, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I think what you're talking about also as I'm as I'm thinking about this is 
I mean, again, theaters, I, sometimes, you know, uh, th it's hard to survive as a theater if you have a space because, I mean, the overhead and all that stuff. And so you have to obviously think out of the box. And that's why certain theater companies, it's just like, well, we don't have a space, but we're going to find a way to still, you know, as an ensemble work together. So you definitely have to um, be almost malleable and kind of be passionate. And I think and, uh, what I heard from what uh, Moose is just saying is just how, um, you know, there, there, there are various different paths, I guess, towards, you know, one's career and experience is just what Moose is talking about. It's just more experience. I'm just going out there and getting experience. I may not ha go the educational route in terms of getting those degrees degrees that's just another way and I mean both are great paths to success it all depends on you know where you land and how you choose to you know go about it um, I think the other thing was um, from what Ishe was saying how I think regionally every, every region's different man every theater like the 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 the, eco the ecology of a theater in one region like here in LA I don't do much work. I'm sorry to say as much as I want to do theater here, I don't do much work here. All the work that I have done mostly is outside of California. I, I, I work in Hawaii. I work in Minnesota. I've taken tours to Alaska because the work here in LA isn't sadly, I mean, there is theater here, but it's not the kind of theater that that is welcoming. It's very elitist, actually, to be honest. And then also the industry is very um, film based. Yeah. And so it's all, you know, I'm an actor coming to LA and every, you know, if that is what you're going for, then it's not, I mean, I, I learned that that's what I learned is like, well, it's not going to be for me. I'm just going to go a different route. And I did children's theater. I actually, I actually performed at the children's theater in Minneapolis, um, you know, and, and opened doors for me doing, doing theater there. So um, it's just one of those things where everyone's journey is different. Um, you know, uh, but I think for us in this in this conversation to recognize, look, the the elitism that is around us and how do we right address it? How do we you know um, find a way to sustain ourselves? Um, you know, because I I mean I in in Minnesota I mean I'm going to be I'm going to say in Minnesota I think there are more opportunities in terms of funding and resources at least from what I've what I know in terms of from, that is different from California. California, I, I've got competition up the yin yang with just so, because the state is big and funding is different, you know? And so I appreciate, you know, just um, the challenges that we have to go through in terms of regions, so, yeah. No, I appreciate that. I just, I'm sorry. I just wanted to say that we do have a lot of resources and we do have a lot of opportunity, but what happens well, only five people, right? Not literally five people, but only mm -hmm. five people get those same amount of resources and opportunities, you know, and you yeah. have, Minnesota is small. You've worked with these people and you're like, well, how did you get there? And they're like, don't worry about it. Go to theater school. And you're like, wait, mm -hmm. but I don't have time to go to theater school. So how did you yeah. get there? Don't worry about it. Go to theater school. It's like, uh, it, it doesn't matter yeah. how many resources and opportunities are here mm -hmm. if I'm not being taught how to I didn't even know that I had to apply for grants until I sat down with Tish Jones and I spoke with Elise you know what I'm saying I spoke with Ashan C. Ford and these are these are people that are not even a part of you know, like at least in a, a, a Shanti is but you know Tish is a part of the poetry community and so it's like what, damn it, how do you write a grant then? Where do I find the grants? You know, like, am I supposed to, how many, how, how many hours in a day or a week does it take to write? It was so many logistical questions I had that I did not receive until after I gave birth to my son, after I had my son and, and the people that were providing it to me were not the people I was serving at this elitist table, you know, for most of my career. And so it's like, it's frustrating. It's so frustrating. Because it's like, y'all see me showing up. Y'all see me hungry. I write the play. You know what I'm saying? Like, I will perform until I am exhausted down to my last bone. You know, like, what more do I need to show y'all that it don't matter if I go to get the fucking theater degree or not? I want this. I can't live without this, you know? Um, 
yeah, we have to we have to stop hiring youth to do the work, but not showing youth how to get it for themselves. You know, it's just it's 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 perpetuating elitism. You know. You know, Isha, you are actually you you already bringing us into the next question because I was gonna ask about gatekeeping, and I know you and I have had a lot of conversations about gatekeeping around knowledge, um, and just like the fact that people want to kind of keep some of the resources a secret, like people don't know, like it's like it's it's amazing how much money actually does exist here that people just don't know about, just because it's just. I don't know why they don't know it. People are hiding it, or like you said, you know, hiring youth to do all this work and like getting these grants to you know work with you. But then you know the ones who are serious and who want to have a career in this later, not not giving them the profession the professional development in order to make a viable career. A lot of it has to be you learn it on your own, or you just do some, or maybe you got one or two people who tell you, but like you said, all the people you expected to mentor you, to show you how to make this a life, you know, some of them didn't do that, you know, and so I do want to touch on gatekeeping and in, in, in terms of like, not just resources, but knowledge and just the ways in which, you know, people kind of try to feel like they have to be the only one, it has to just be me, and I'm the only one that gets these resources, you know, um, so yeah, I would love to, you know, move into that part of the conversation and you know talk about examples of gatekeeping that you all have experienced or noticed um but yes yes yeah um i want to speak a little bit to that um i do definitely think like knowledge of theater is actually really resourceful very useful um from the <laughs> expansion and details of like what goes into the play all the way to the simplicity of like what is stage direction, what is upstage, downstage, stage right, stage left. Um, I always find that like the more knowledge that I gain through theater, the more I want to distribute it to those who don't know about it. Um, and so for a little bit, uh, I was a director, mainly a facilitator of devised pieces. And what I come to learn a lot about those pieces whether it's youth or my peers or folks that are older than me, my elders, I've come to learn that there is there is a spectrum of knowledge. You know, there's people that know so much, and there's people that don't know even know the bare necessities of what like a proscenium is and like you know a moat and like stuff like that. And so I found that what makes theater more fulfilling for me is being able to to share that knowledge because I feel like for me to keep that knowledge or to talk down to a youth like, what? You don't know what downstage right means? Who? You, you, you know, that 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 creates and re-perpetuates the, the idea of uh, um, that elitism in, in spaces. And instead of me being assumptive of them knowing this theater knowledge, I, I break myself down and I go from the beginning and I, I say, okay, we gonna do this. Who knows what this means? Raise your hand. Can you explain to everybody what this means? Because at the end of the day, um, when we're in theater, I think of theater as changing someone's life, impacting someone. Um, not necessarily about like the intentional um, creation of something based on everybody who knows theater. I think about it as this is a performance that communities want to see. So how do we work together to create this performance? Um, and so I've come to realize that a lot of that distribution creates more awareness and also more knowledge you share with everybody. Um, and to suppress that information almost makes you no different than the oppressor. It makes you no different than that elitist um, you know, creator that, that always assumes they, that you should know and create a space of knowledge. Because also from the perspective of the theater maker who may not may contain all the knowledge, there's people in those spaces that know a lot of things that you don't know either, you know, that they will teach you, that they'll inform you about in, in ways that you didn't see coming. And you, you come in thinking you know all these things, but then it's a whole different experience when you're talking about the topic at hand 
or the people who are coming to this space and the intentions of why you're doing this performance for that audience. Um, so I definitely think distributing knowledge is, is a necessity in order to build that, that clarity and that acknowledgement of voices that don't really connect to that as much. I actually, um, first off, thank you, Malik, for your words and thank you for the information that you brought into the space. Um, I would like to touch on gatekeeping in the way that, I mean, personally, if I'm going to be very raw and blunt here about gatekeeping, how I view it, I think gatekeeping is frankly stupid um, because it has not gotten us anywhere. It hasn't moved us forward. It hasn't propelled us in any shape or form. And the definition of insanity is struggling in the same spot over and over and over and not finding a way to break out of that. And a lot of gatekeeping also comes from, I think, the theatrical e economy. We think about it like this on Broadway, New York is home to so many diverse residents, so many people. But at the end of the day, the, the shows are curated for white baby bloomer audiences, you know, the ones who came up starting Steppenwolf, that like 70s, 80s era. And the thing is, the theater community, like right now, too, has not moved from when the first regional theaters were established. And like, even going back to when we're talking about overlooking, at the end of the day, they fund black theaters lower than they fund a lot of like bigger elitist white theaters. You see it every year when they announce the grant list and all the like BIPOC theaters are like at the bottom and the base of the money provided. And so if the, the like the more, I think it's, it's important for us to look at the past reflect on it and see the mistakes we made so that way we can propel our future of tomorrow. It's kind of like how I even write plays sometimes. I do like go back to like one, a lot of black playwrights but also like white playwrights too but then I take that white aesthetic and flip it on its head for what my generation will look at in terms of like maybe like how would it feel to have a video and more digital plays? How would it feel to even like going from how we even market, marketing has changed too. The thing is a lot of people, the theater doesn't want to change. Hollywood has been constantly changing every year. There's a new thing that comes back to change and constantly does this, but theater constantly stays in this high class society. So it's not even like at the end of the day, we can't even look on the theater and be like, I wonder why we're not getting that much money. Maybe that's because your target audience is suffering too. And until we learn to leave the value of the white American dollar in proportion to like the BIPOC person's dollar and like the value of that money, at the end of the day, it's the same thing of like if 200 people gave $1 or if 200 people gave $10 each, that's $2,000 already raised and changing it and maybe trying to do more instead of like only calling in people of color for, hey, we're doing, um, this black play, therefore black people only come say this, mark it there. Mm -hmm. Or we're doing the same, we're, oh, we're doing Miss Saigon again to show that we're this and like actually care about people, which it's a, let me not get in trouble here, but we all know how we, <laughs> y'all, we know. And like, we only call for Asian people. Or it's like, hey, we're doing Hamilton, but it's like $500 a ticket. So go to Disney plus, which is like, oh, this amount that's expensive. And even with shows and streaming and like marketing, it's just something that like theater, if we are going to say theater is for all, we need to go back and stand by it. We can't just do Shakespeare's plays, but then charge people like thousands of dollars to come see it. When back in the day, it was actually the people who are the peasants and the nobodies that were actually coming to see it. Hmm. It's just, how do we gatekeep the right traditions and the right things? instead of gatekeeping our mistakes and saying, no, 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 this is right. So we're gonna keep going. It's like how we announced our town for the, for the first show to come forward for the Broadway season with Dustin Hoffman. Yeah. After the George Floyd protests, we see you at American theater, our town. And why? Because there is a whole audience that they're reaching out to instead of focusing on the millennials and the youth of today. It's just this proportion that is like easy to fix, but people's pride does not want to change and fix it. Mm -hmm. It's like, once you learn the same thing as the white man, like you feel there is that like status update that goes towards that person rather than a person who does a different practice of like stuff. 
It's like when they say there are not enough black playwrights and not enough Asian playwrights, when there's a plethora of people writing, no one's funding them, no one's publishing them enough, people aren't going to give back. And now we're seeing the trend of playwrights in Hollywood coming back and giving back from Katori Hall to Jeremy O'Harris. It's something that even the bigger theaters should look at. It's something like from my project, Nyjaz Alive, we raised a scholarship for a black girl coming in to my program next year. Something that I think my school should follow suit with as well. Yeah. And so it's just like, why keep, why do we, instead of like trying and going, instead of asking people of color, what can we do to be better? What can we do to be better? And we've told you in like 800 different ways, 800 different grants, 800 different thesis statements, languages. Like <laughs> at this point, it's like up to go Google translate it and do it. And it's not just the thing of like, we don't know any better anymore because it's like, if me at my 20 year old age can do such a small impact and have a scholarship fund dedicated to a black female theater artist, what is your excuse as an organization that has been here for more than 50 years? Yeah. That's what I wanted to add. Well, what do you think is their reason? What do you think is making them hesitant? Like what is the... Um, I don't want to say it because it's a bad word, <laughs> but <laughs> the chat. Uh, am I free to curse on here? You can curse. Okay. Um, well, some bullshit, personally speaking, <laughs> I'm sorry, but it is. And it's like the notion of we don't have enough funding. First mm -hmm. off, who are you going to, to fund your stuff? They always say it starts at the top with funding. You need to look at your, your theater board of directors and look at how many voices of color are here, how many women are here, how many, and then it's the thing of, there's been this trend when it's like, they say, oh, we want more women directors, but it's only white women being hired. Mm -hmm. So it's then like, one, there's already a problem of like feminism versus womanism. And we're just hearing now and more from more contemporary black female like feminists today. And it's like, that thing of who is funding it and what do they want to see? You can, and so, yeah. So I got a question. What, a, what if you don't want to be a part of white theater? Cause I have no interest in being a part of white theater as a black woman, um, as, a, as a black queer theater maker, I have no desire. <laughs> like I don't have any desire. So. I I really want to know what what happens to my career then. You self like, you self produce and you find the money yourself, right? Um, I've done that for my my second play, the Mung Lao Friendship play. We got forty five thousand dollars from the State Arts Board, and I think something important for people to understand about Minnesota funding is in November in two thousand eight, the people of Minnesota voted to increase our taxes so that we would get more funding towards clean water, um, land, and to um, fund the arts, right? Mm -hmm. So before then, we were, there was only like $7 million that was being doled out to, you know, institutions and to like little organizations here and there and to artist grants. And then with this, this um, legacy amendment, there's like $30 million each year or something like that. I mean, yeah, the, the people like the Guthrie, which I refer to them as the Ikea with an erection, <laughs> they, they still get tons of more, they get tons more money than say Pangea, you know? Mm -hmm. But, um, and it's still competitive, competitive, even with like the individual grants that you, you can get as an artist who is self-producing. It's still very little, but um, the competition is still a lot. The wonderful thing is that there are more grant programs than before. So maybe you're competing with like 200 people for the, the thing, but at least there's eight other grant programs you can still apply to. Mm -hmm. and, I, and, and grants, they're not, they're not sustainable, obviously, but um, hey, it's better to spend five hours writing the thing to potentially get $45,000. So you don't have to pay out of pocket. And then you can pay people in your community more equitably, right? Like that's, like, why would you want to perpetuate, you know, we have to operate from a place of abundance. Like we can't, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe that's, you know, like the bullshit. They just don't want to operate from a place of abundance. It's always like this. What's the, what's, what's the opposite of abundance? 
It's a scarcity. It's yep. scarcity. scarcity and, or lack. Yeah. And that's what gatekeeping has been for me. It has been literally like, oh no, just do just do the contracted work. We only got fifty dollars to pay you. We know you need to eat for like a week, but that's okay. We only got fifty dollars, and that's it, right? Because the most of most of the money that we got to fund this program or this this art idea or project, you know, you don't have enough credibility to get paid more. Yeah, we see you do this other show, but it's okay. We only got this much money for you. And and what I'm learning is self-advocacy, right? And I'm learning to say, you know what, that's not gonna work for me because I have a child to feed, you know. Yes. But I had to go out and find that language. Yes. Right. After being a part of a community for eight years, I had to go find that language. And I think that that gatekeeping, um, it it has to be eradicated. It, it has to go. Yeah, I agree with you. And also what you're saying is, uh, and what Moose is saying also is that as, as BIPOC artists, you, you have to build other skill sets. You can't just be, I mean, and hey, you can be the greatest actor in the world. You can be the greatest writer in the world. But we know that just to do that one thing, it takes many different ways to do it. And so learning to grant write, learning to network, and be connected with other networks that are in alliance with what you're doing. Um, you know, uh, Alternate Roots, Network of Ensemble Theaters, Latinx Commons, Black Theater Commons, you know, National Performance Network. These are certain networks and that may have opportunities you know, to open that up for you. Um, I think that's really what's been a learning process in terms of, as an artist, you know, you, you, like, I, Unfortunately, I, I can't just stick to one thing. I have to learn to, to you know, understand grant writing. I have to learn to network and be connected with others and support each other. I mean, that's really what it is. And cultivate our communities so that they value the arts, so that we value ourselves. I mean, and, and what um, Ishe, you're talking about is business skills, right? It's just like, hey, I can't work that way. I'm going to have to, you know what? This is how much I value myself. And th these are my rates, all right? And then you decide if you want to work with me or not. I mean, that's really advocating for yourself and learning, you know, that, hey, I have all this experience and skill. I mean, I have the degree, but I have other things. And so I'm, it's wonderful to hear. And, you know, and then it's, you're, you're learning along the way. So I really appreciate that, uh, hearing that, you know. And uh, Mooks is the same thing, saying, look, I, I just do what I do and I just do what I can, you know, and that's where I learn. So we're, le we're learning. Um, I've been, you know, uh, fortunate enough to just be with a theater company that um, does connect nationally with these organizations and these other orgs that that expand my network. And so that's what for me has been very, very helpful uh, in terms of as we talk about gate, gatekeeping and stuff. And hey, I'm not saying that it's all easy peasy because all these organizations, as much as I rattle them in, they all have issues of their own in terms of elitism as well. I mean, so you know, we, we just, you work within the systems and hopefully as you continue, there may be, op, you know, opportunities and doors, but, but the, the more you, um, uh, it's kind of like, to me, it's like fishing. You can fish with a, just, just, you can go fishing with just with a pole or you can throw a big net, you know, and for me, I'm like, I'm throwing that big net out there and then just kind of gathering and seeing what I have. So those are some analogies I have in terms of, uh, yeah. Uh, one's career. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that point of cultivating community because I feel like doing that teaches you, you a new different way of defining equity toward that community you're cultivating and also providing a clearer sense of how you give those resources. Um, one beautiful thing I was appreciative of was being a part of um, uh, Red Eyes uh, uh, New Works Festival. Um, and through that, our cohort gets an opportunity to work with our own teams and create these pieces, these short, like 10, 15 minute pieces. And they give us funding for that. Um, I could have used that as an opportunity to be like, okay, I'm getting this funding. Woo, it's for me. I'm gonna just hire all these people for free and we gonna get it going. But what I also felt like was an opportunity to open my mind to a possible system I could recreate for myself. Um, 
So not only providing an opportunity for artists, but also using this, this funding to distribute to these artists as a tool to recreate in itself this like cultivation of a new structured system that we could follow through. Um, and definitely I've, I've learned from those other artists that it, it, it's fueled them to really rethink and reimagine the way they collaborate and create spaces. But I also feel like that's just in general, cultivating community is really just teaching yourself how to create your own boundaries, but then also push away from these same type of systems that continue to diminish, that continue to abuse and not give you any good conversation for it um, in return. So I had another point and I lost it, but. <laughs> I also just wanted to like tag on to like Isha, you asked a really important question about like, if I don't want to practice white theater, what do I do? I think also a thing about inclusion that we always fail to understand is that like inclusion is like recognizing the differences every person has and trying to pay attention to that. Because we say inclusion is like, for instance, the debate of like a lot of like cis women and trans women and like, oh, well, you have puberty stuff for like cis girls in school. I'm, I'm gonna relate this back to theater, I promise y'all. Like you have puberty like teaching girls and cis girls in school, but you don't have like puberty teaching like kids exploring like their gender, their gender identities, all these questions, blah, blah, blah. And so it's like also inclusion in the theater. We have to recognize like also there is a difference in like how BIPOC people are paid, who has more respect when or where. And um, especially like a challenge to the white theaters too. I think it's like, maybe broadening their database, really thinking about, okay, I want to direct Twelfth Night. It doesn't mean like you have to pick another like white director for this, or you don't have to pick the same Asian director, or, like the same time you do, um, oh, I want to do lyric. It's like how I, we have to redefine how we view the term nonprofit, if not all Americans are profiting off of that. It's like knowing you have this money and resource and being like, actually, instead of trying to spend money on trying to get the rights to this really expensive show, why don't I fund something in my community and have a festival of different shows? It's kind of like redistribution of power and redistribution of economics. Like there's a, like, again, also it goes down to the American government system, how there's a place of checks and balances, right? But yet we fail to observe checks and balances for all. Look at the Capitol last the no pun intended shit that went down at the Capitol last week. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm so sorry, but um, just to come back to my point, I think it's just like a lot of like redistribution and reallocation of funds. It's like how you calculate how much time you're spending chasing one thing when you can create 300, three different other things. I found my point, that was beautiful. Um, I also just have a special appreciation for ambiance um, because I feel like what Roy Boko is speaking to, what Ova is speaking to, um, what Ishe is speaking to kind of points to a lot of the intentions that at least had begun was this not only creating this space for Black, <laughs> for Black bodies, but also to provide a different vision of how we see theater you know um and so I think that was in particular when we come to, when it comes to audience that re-envisioning was super strong because when we think about American theater when we think about um the ways of the audience of American theater it kind of goes to what Rory Boko was saying earlier is that it it, it feels like it's a it's a it's it is it's glorified and it's it's painted with this idea that only the those who can afford it can be there um uh and when you point it to that it's usually always going to end up being a predominantly white all white audience or predominantly white and rich um audience and so it was really really important to pay attention to what at least was doing because she was re-envisioning that to say we will provide we'll provide spaces for us right now we we're we put the marketing, we put the attention toward those who not only look at us, but those who don't often come to theater spaces to see theater work. And when that happened, 
um, I'm especially thinking about the garden in 2019, we had packed houses of just all black people. And in my experience of theater, I had never seen that. <laughs> and that was brand new, that was brand new, but it also connected to that conversation about how do we re-envision our audience? How do we cultivate that community? Going back to that, cultivating that community so that we're providing a new system for ourselves and not following the same that we suppose or we should assume we rely on. So that, also yeah. Also even theater my... culture too. Like, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah. they're, like, I think we should really ask that question. Why is it that there are some black, that black people that like some of us, like as people of color, we see theater and go, that's white people stuff. Why is it that like black people and like a lot of people of color like come into theater spaces just wanting to see a show that is about us yet it's like, should I be here? Is this weird? Like, how do I, there is like this innate, um, I think like we have to acknowledge that the fact that, like a lot of theater culture and a lot of the theater community doesn't, no matter how freaking liberal we may swear we may be is also built on racism like half of the america half of america as a country itself and also have, we have to acknowledge that find a way to move past that and also look at the effects of colonialism on the american theater mm -hmm. and we have to stop saying like bipoc shows are only risks or this risky new take if i already if as a black person if i'm already living my life scared of being like in danger the art I consume and you're telling me my identity is constantly a risk to you. I am constantly harmful to your organization. Just using that word on like even describing a lot of like black women's art. Oh, this risky new take on this or this risky new approach for our education thing. Like you have to stop. Like if you continue to call one group of people the villain, you're never going to be able to move past in your story. Yeah, absolutely. I know for like the Lao community, they don't go to certain theater spaces or theater because they don't recognize that form of theater. Mm. We come with our very own rich history of what theater looks like and how it's been practiced over the centuries, right? Mm -hmm. um, we go to see a show at the Guthrie, we're like, oh, and first of all, that's a joke. We don't go see a show at the Guthrie. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> going there it looks like a foul it's too phallic we're not doing it we're buddhists um no but they don't recognize that 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 form so they don't they don't feel welcome they don't feel um yeah i don't know any other thoughts <laughs> but but that you're right i mean there is i mean knowing what we know there is a history of I mean, the, the question of what is theater to within that community, what is theater to you? And, and I would have to say also throwing in besides colonialism, capitalism. I mean, it's the, the, the we're, we're talking about it's, it's, you know, when you think of theater, is it a luxury? You know, I mean, and, and if it is, then how, if you are a, a person, you know, if you are middle class, lower class, I mean, I'm not even thinking about theater, man. I'm just thinking about putting, you know, food on the table and, and paying for rent and raising my kids. So those are some of the, the, the factors that, you know, come into play. And, um, you know, so yeah, that's for me, it's, that's why I'm like, uh, the, the, having to understand and cultivate the audience and understand like where they come from is re important and, and really getting to know your community. And I think, that's where how you know we do it we we always do the outreach and the outwork uh, and the work to 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 share what we're creating within our community i think it's when when elitism comes in when there are organizations that, that just want um you know just uh uh just to, to almost like pander to that specific community and say come come over you know come over to our theater and this is what it's supposed to be like mm -mm. Theater storytelling, man, it goes back to, I mean, it's ritual. It goes back to what we've all been talking about. We have such a rich history and a rich culture of storytelling. If you go back to the basics of it, that's what theater is. Someone telling a story to a group of people, right? I think and so if that is the case, then that's, I mean, you know, I mean, that's the bare basics of theater. It's just come to the point where, um, as where Boko had mentioned about, you know, well, America is built on, you know, this, and I mean, we can, yeah, uh, even go further on that. And, you know, we, we are, you know, doing 
what we can to, to kind of represent, to kind of be out there and to really shift and change, you know, the way that people see theater. Because I'm, I'm part of American theater. We're all part of American theater. What aspect of that theater scene is, that's, that's the question, right? And where is the value, you know, that's been giving the support that's been giving to this aspect of American theater? I just want to add that I I want to just add that being like my find my foundational practice in theater is storytelling, right? And that it wasn't just all like all white people and just me, or mm. all you know what I'm saying like Latinx Hispanic people and just me, or all black people and just me, or all you know. I was in a classroom full of people that was coming from different economic statuses, different, you know, cultural backgrounds that spoke multiple languages. It's, it wasn't just me. I didn't just see me. I seen a, a melting pot of, of different students. You know, I wasn't just speaking my story. I was hearing other stories. Um, and, as, and now being an older person directing, I see the value in just opening my first rehearsal process is having people talk about themselves in their life. You don't really get that in traditional theater environments, right? You don't really, you don't really have the director asking, well, how do you feel about that? You know, like, tell me what you experienced while doing this, right? And I learned that just by being in a community of, of, of stories, right, um, that, were also just not my own and having a basic respect for that really like helps me as I move forward in these very like structured you know spaces and these very like oh well this is how we do it here space it helps me stay grounded in who I am and say I'll be here for your accolades that's okay but when I leave here and people are coming right through ambiance theater and they're doing a rehearsal with with me, they're going to be able to leave and say that was a that was a, a fulfilling experience, yeah. you know. And shout out to Elise because, <laughs> oh my goodness, yes, we had a we had an audience full of black people, and they were able to snap and be like, mm-hmm, yep, yep, and and feel and laugh and express something that audiences aren't able to do in in white theater, right? They're supposed to just be quiet and just watch and laugh. Which is antithetical to white theater because go back to Shakespeare and whenever he would perform his plays, they weren't quiet. The actors were talking to people like y'all just OD as hell about some. But just But just making sure that we were doing <laughs> theater that felt like home, right? That, that felt like ours, that wasn't tied to whiteness. Even if there was white people in... We probably had like what one or two white people in the audience. Yeah. They we didn't even make them feel no type of way about being there, right? Because theater is inclusive without removing people's identity. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And yeah, I don't know if we went on this one question for way too long and went into other questions, but it, yeah. And even like a point you bring up too, like a lot of BIPOC cultures did theater outside. And the thing I never, I always like question too with like a lot of people that do outdoor shows, amphitheaters, um, for me it was like, why haven't you thought about producing like a bunch of like different culturally selective shows? Because at the end of the day too, like for instance, a lot of people think that the main language of America is English. America does not have an official language, people. Mm-hmm. And it's just fact. You can Google it and like, I won't be wrong. And it'll be embarrassing for whoever tried to argue with me. And it's just like, (laughs) if you see that there are these diverse languages, these diverse cultures, like representative of all of like your country, a thing that could have even been practiced outdoors, like even with COVID, like in distance shows, there could be outdoor shows going on right now. They could have put on tents with heaters and still done something in the winter as well. And like, still like it, it's just like, there's just this one view and everyone is like a lot of theater too, like even follow like the same Arist- Aristotelian like form of writing. There's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end. Whereas in it's like, 
if you keep following just that that linear line and you're looking at that linear focus that has been what you've been taught from all these training programs, all these audition rooms, all of this trauma you've been through, and you don't try to broaden past that, like eventually theater may possibly die as an American art form, dare I say. Mm. Because you're going down a road trying to go forward, but meanwhile, all your thoughts and all of your mistakes are things pulling you back. And it's like, I saw this really cute video one time because when I first started my role to theater, when I came to America too, I used to just, I couldn't go to Broadway, obviously, because I was in school, but like, I would just watch like Broadway clips online. And say Sengbo said this really cool thing about like, no, like with technique, it's like knowing technique and it's something I've just started doing, especially in my black life too, like knowing technique knowing your personal identity and then knowing how to bring that round around and sell yourself as a product which is still also based off of capital sam and all that stuff and like the bourgeoisie and yeah hey yo i absolutely love the movement of this conversation i mean i'm over here supposed to be moderating y'all just and you know going on with it you know so i'm super super grateful we're on our last five minutes um for tonight and so i want to wrap up with um you know how are you personally um dismantling elitism in your own practices and like how what other ideas you have moving forward i know we've already touched on it a little bit in just different um points in our conversation you know, I know for myself personally, like like Malik was saying, like to me, audiences is huge. You know, like I personally got tired um, when I was a young person, you know, performing for St. Paul Public Schools. I got tired of performing my trauma in front of all these white teachers, you know, and then having them be like, but I'm, I'm in this classroom and so I don't agree with you. And it's like, but this is real. Like in a lot of students in your classroom have had this experience I've had. You know, and so for me, it was important to cultivate that space where Black folks came to theater and saw theater and interacted with us because of the healing that can happen in those spaces. You know, and to feel like I'm sharing my story with people who care about it, you know, who are not just, oh, that was wonderful, even though I'm over here telling you some really painful and heart-wrenching things about my life. Or even if it's my joy and just, you know, trying to characterize it, I mean, caricature my joy and like, who I am as a human being. And so um, that's how I want to continue moving forward is making sure that the work that I do is always connected to the people who I value and who value me. And it's not just about how many people are in the audience or trying to make, you know, make myself look like I'm not, I, I want to, I want to steer away from caring too much about the accolades because I'm, I'm noticing how people view me differently with some of the accolades I've gotten and I'm grateful for all of the opportunities. I ain't trying to say I don't want no more fellowships, but I am trying to say is that, you know, what's most important to me about theater is, is it healing me? Is it healing the people around me? And is it healing the audiences? Because we are walking in generations and generations worth of, of pain and trauma in history in this country that has not been dealt with which is why we saw them fools at Capitol, because you know them was the police anyway, because how they get in there in the first place. Anyway, <laughs> I didn't mean to take up that much time, but uh, I do want, I still want us to be able to, um, you know, have our last moment of checking, of checking out and talking about like how we moving forward will continue to dismantle elitism in our own practice. Any one of y'all can start. Thank you again so much. Um, for me, I just, uh, I, I want to, and I have been and continue to encourage and invest in supporting artists of color. That's, you know, that, that's, that's it. So thank you. Thank you. Um, for me, I'm going to try and make this short. Learning, actually, like with my education, um, constantly being a student in and out of the theater room like for instance I went to a football game y'all I have no idea about football but from that football game I was inspired about writing a play about NCAA athletes and how they treat young black boys and black girls mm -hmm. um you know what I mean and it's stuff like that or even with like school like 
not being afraid to like, I feel like everybody's so quick to be a teacher, but nobody wants to be a student, especially in like call out culture now, especially people my age. And I'm like, can you shut up and listen before you attack? Like, ooh. And so for me, it's just like constantly learning, but also like constantly challenging my learning and knowing like, no, I don't think that's like how my life can go. I could still get a career, even if I don't have 10 million followers on Instagram or just because, oh, maybe I don't like, August Wilson is not the only black playwright. If August Wilson is a theater company's only black best friend, you're part of the problem, okay? Um, it's true. And if Miss Saigon is your only like age best friend, you are part of the problem. I'm sorry, somebody had to tell you if it was me, oh well. Um, and so, yeah, it's just that thing of like, constantly knowing that like, I'm, I'm never gonna sit here and be like, there's not enough black playwrights. Okay, girl, but that's just my thoughts. Thank you. <laughs> right, because it's not just August Wilson, it's also Lorraine Hansberry, you know, Alice Childress, um, Aisha Rahman, and Dominic Marie. So I'm thinking of them, just throwing them out. I mean, there's so many, you know, um, and there's so many stories told and so many more to tell. And I think for me, what I'm hoping to do to annihilate or remove elitism uh, is continuing to acknowledge those stories, acknowledge the stories that are um, belittled, forgotten, um, silenced. Um, I want to be a part of spaces that acknowledge and uplift those voices, uh, uplift those new stories, and provide nuance to theater spaces that lack a lot of it um, because in the end what was going to help grow and what's going to help expand the theater is by seeing those stories and um, that's what's going to bring our communities together that's what's going to expand our community within this this theater realm um, and also create create nuance. I think that's just the, the brighter end that I think too much theater is done too frequently, too often, for absolutely no reason, and teaches nothing, you know, in comparison to these, these missing stories that are often put on the, the back burner to, to tell another yet again, <laughs> Ibsen story, yet another, again, another Shakespearean, you know, show. Um, I wanna see more black voices on those stages, but I also want to be a part of and witness those new spaces being created as well, so. Thank you. I can, I can go. Um, oh gosh, this, I love this group. This group is so great. Like, I think we should meet more often and I will, I will pay your stipends. Um, uh, let's see. So something that I've done and will continue to do is I like to, as much as I can, eliminate barriers for people. So I know that grant proposal writing or like even just identifying grants, which is even being able to understand and navigate grant world is a huge obstacle for a lot of our, um, our artists in our communities, right? So what I do is I just, I help artists write grant proposals and I help them um, with project ideation and all this other stuff and, and to help people find funding. So I'm gonna continue to do that um, because there's, there's an abundance. There's a lot out there. We just need to go and get it because we deserve it. It's like also a lot of people ask the same question whenever a guest artist comes like, how do I make it? How do I make it? And they always say like, create your own work. Like, and also a thing like, I think that's also kind of rebellious is like being confident in my like black identity because like I also came to America at 14, I'm an international student. And it's like being confident and like that is enough in itself and it doesn't have to change rather I could just add on more tools rather than seeing like I have to change for whiteness because that's how I'll get ahead it's just like something that I do in my part 
because at the end of the day, it is like, it's funny how like when a black, when a person of color comes into a room and is confident, we're deemed the villain. But when a white person does it, they're seen as the savior and Messiah of the world. And so I think like, that's just something that I continuously try to do because I think like being black and happy and black joy and like POC and BIPOC joy is an act of rebellion in itself. Um. I would never see myself through the eyes of, of white America. <laughs> um, that's how I continue as an artist um, in this country by doing what my children need um, and doing what is going to help them prevail um, and survive and live um, when I am dead and gone. Um, I'm gonna always create um, for black and brown folk um, to remind them that we do not need we do not need the affirmation of white theater um, to be doing what we do. We do not need the credentials or the accolades of white theater to do what we do um, because we live and we breathe and us existing and us expressing um, is, is a testimony um, and, it, and it's gonna impact people on the everyday. Um, and so, yeah, I thank y'all so much for having me on this panel. I, I love each and every one of y'all and we are doing the necessary work even when it is tough because it is tough. Um, and so much gratitude to each and every one of you. Thank y'all so much. This is a wonderful conversation. I definitely, we do need to get together again and just continue with, the, the, with this work. Um, I also want to thank everyone who tuned in to listen to our conversation tonight. You are so appreciated. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and next time.